Remember, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. Out of carnality is confession of that sin into spirituality of the indwelling Holy Spirit. 1 John 1 9, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. That cleanses takes us to the cross of Christ, where he shed his blood for redemption and for sanctification. When the believer confesses his sin, he gets back into sanctificational, experiential sanctification. The ministry of the Holy Spirit. So you should do that. That's required of you for Bible study. The Holy Spirit might teach you and recall the truth of the Lord God. So our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way by the automobile and the internet. I pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the Word of God within our souls. I pray, Father, for Al today as he comes and brings us a message upon his heart from the Lord. Mm. I want to thank you, Father. I want to take a moment today to thank you for the miracle that you've provided in the vaccine and the encouragement that it came in the season of Christmas. I don't think any of this is coincidence. I believe it's all been pre planned predestined, and is now in our hands to figure out and to apply to our life. I pray we might have some insight to it today as we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the things I found very interesting when they brought the vaccine out was the timing. There's no doubt there was a real battle not to have it brought out this early. But if you thought it was the battle of Politics, that was only a small part of it. The greater picture in it would have been in the angelic conflict. That Satan doesn't like God to get credit for anything. Yep. Not in your life or outside your life. Yep. We must be we must be so much more on top of our game than that. What I found interesting also was listening, I began to listen to the different channels and what their overview was of the fact of the vaccine and the distribution, the idea of the speed of it to be distributed quickly. And I found a common theme among the news channels, which was interesting to me. And the common theme was that this was a miracle. A miracle. You don't hear too much truth from a lot of the news media in these days, especially during elections. They got that one right. Then I thought, I wondered if, it, if it's due to the season. I wonder if this vaccine had come out in May or June, what they might have called it. I think the season had a lot to do with it. This is Christmas. And everything connected to Christmas is a miracle. I think sometimes we forget it because we get a little too commercial in Christmas, but what do I know? I was married to Jane. She was the most gift-giving person you ever met in your life, so Christmas was, we bought for Christmas all year long. She truly was the Santa Claus from North Pole. South Pole, I guess. Mm. I don't know what pole she was from. A miracle. See, when you get the word miracle, 
You're with God. Now, they probably didn't realize that any more than they realized the word Christmas is about Christ. It took them years to figure that out. Then when they tried to take it away, the average guy in the street pushed back on them. If it's a miracle, it's all about God. If it's a miracle, it's a God thing. The interesting thing about this miracle it involves science. So what you want to watch for is whether or not the science world wants to take credit for the miracle. They can take credit for the science, but they can't, can't take credit for the miracle. The credit to the miracle of it goes to God. You and I both know that the creator, the creator God is the God of science. Whether they recognize it or not, it's true. He's the creator. That's why when he does something like a miracle, he, he can manipulate science. <laughs> a miracle is the, in the science world is a manipulation of it. It's a manipulation of it. So I saw a wonderful thing, a light in my soul that we've been talking about making sure your people know the attachment. The virus was a disciplinary program. Just like, just like when we studied Elijah, the drought was. It was to, to cause a spiritual awakening among the people and bring them back. To bring a spiritual awakening in the world to God. This virus went across the world. The cure for it would be just as miraculous. And so I saw something wonderful this Christmas. God removed the curse. He removed the curse. He removed the discipline. Whatever, and I believe the primary reason for the whole thing was bring a spiritual awakening, especially in the church. We've been so, we have been so asleep. So he's removed it. The vaccine is the proof, just like the cloud coming in with Elijah, the cloud coming in from the sea. Go back and look, go back and look, go back and look. You see it coming? Yeah. What was it bringing? Blessings. It's going to bring blessings. Which says that God had removed the curse and is now blessing. You need to know that you're in the season of blessing. And it's no coincidence. It's in the divine decree of God that he would manipulate this whole thing in such a way that the blessings of the virus, the, the blessings that would come from it, the, bless, the blessings that would come from the vaccine over the virus would come at Christmas, the season of miracles. And I believe that's a sign. I believe that it's a sign that's obvious for the world to see. I really believe that. Then it comes down to you and I. We've got to be like in the story of Bethlehem. We've got to be the good shepherds. We've got to be the good shepherds. You know what the good shepherds did? They carried the message away. Joy to, joy, joy to the world. We love that song. Hey, that's the shepherds. That's the shepherd's theme song. We've got to be good shepherds of this season. We've got to understand what God has done for us in bringing this vaccine with, with light speed to us so that it would hit during the birth of Christ, the season of miracles. 
So we need to be good shepherds, and we need to carry this message to our people. We need to stop living in the shadow of fear and start living in the shadow of blessings. Blessings. This is the season for blessings. The season of cursing is over. And now we live in the same. Should, should, should we not be cautious? Yes, of course. Should be fearful? Never. I'm telling you that in, in your heart, you must not do that. You must not do that. The vaccine is as, is as much evidence that the curse has been removed and the blessings have been restored as the, as the, as the drought and the rain in the time of Elijah. What we do with it, what we do with it is everything. I'm telling you, it's everything. How we take the time of blessing and how we bring God back to the people. Elijah's, Elijah didn't do it and his people didn't do it. And I'll tell you, nothing good will come from this whole event if we do not become good shepherds of the word of God. It's one thing to have vaccine, and I thank you God for it. It'll be another thing when you get it, you thank God for it. But it's there to make you a good shepherd. This is the season that we must go forth. We must go forth and tell the truth whether it hurts them or doesn't. It's the way of salvation. And therefore, tomorrow you can Tomorrow evening, you can look up in the clouds and see the star of Christmas. We can look up in heaven and see the star. Listen, I want you to put all that stuff together in your soul. I want you to put it all together. If you go, if you go back to sitting on the bench and not being a player, we're going to be in a bigger mess down the road than we were in. This is a preview. So I encourage you. I don't want to take any more else time. I encourage you. Let's pray. What a thankful heart I bring to you today, Father, for all your blessings. This is the great season of the birth of your son. We make great tribute to that. And beyond that, the vaccine, Father, that you've given us. What a wonderful Christmas gift. What a wonderful thing for the seniors out there in these nursing homes that have taken the blunt of it. You've seen the kind heart hearted of some of the authority that says, no, they, go, they get it first. And then and there's, there's a system of giving it out on protocol. And I'm thankful for that. Be without today, Father, who seek conclusions. Uh, morning message. I pray for him, Father, and for his family, Ernie, and all the other, other ministries going on in this church. Encourage our hearts, Father, to be good shepherds 2021. Good shepherds, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's look at the gift of undeserved suffering. Now, I know I'm known as Mr. Jolly, happy guy, but everything God allows is for good. As we see things going on in our nation that you may not be used to, we see institutions that we've counted on perhaps failing us and betraying us. It's quite possible. We need to understand that this is a gift what pastor's trying to tell us, that, that all of this 2020 has been a gift to wake people up, to show people their need. For everyone who's been caught up in all of the politics, look, you, you, can, you can know what's right 
and yet watch the politics fail you, just betray you and turn on you. And realize, if, if, you're, if you're listening to the Lord, you'll realize that was never the answer anyway. It's only the stage on which we play out the drama of our Christian life. So, possibly we're going to have a different emphasis in government. Who knows? Who knows what's going to happen? But it doesn't, listen, it's not the issue for us. I don't say it doesn't matter. I'm saying it's not the issue. We live above, our purposes are above, our means are above, all the human realm. We have a divine purpose to, to be a witness for Christ in this life. We can do that in a wonderful government or an evil government. Listen, we've had the benefit of a wonderful government for a long time. That's not true of many, many Christians throughout all of history in other parts of the world. It's not true. There's been many types of governments. We've been through very dark times in world history, and Christianity actually benefits from adversity. Christians benefit from adversity because it, it forces you to ask yourself what's real and what's important. Now, we all love prosperity, but prosperity can often be the trap, the bear trap, in which we lose all of our focus, get caught up in what we're able to do. Oh, I've got everything paid off, and now I have the freedom to go and do and do and do. Well, look, I mean, but is that your purpose? Is that why God has left you here? I think everybody, look, I'm trying to uh, adopt a motto that says, day by day, I'm going to have fun. With all the things that God has put in my life, I'm going to have fun with it. I'm going to quit being stressed. I'm going to quit worrying about it. I'm going to leave it up to him, and I'm going to have fun. I'm going to enjoy my life. I've gotten a lot of freedom from my old man stuff. Not, it's not, doesn't, doesn't drag me down like it used to. I've got freedom to walk in the spirit and, and, and be focused on the Lord, and I'm going to have fun with that. But look, that doesn't mean everything's going to go easy. Doesn't mean if you're under blessing that it's going to, all your circumstances are going to be what you want them to be. Listen, God is the author. He's the one that controls your life and your circumstances. And sometimes he gives you this gift. Philippians 1.29, for to you grace has been given. That word granted, that's the word he says it's been granted or given to you. And that word charizoma means to be given grace. Chorus is grace. Grace has been given to you for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. Now, I'm going to focus on suffering related to government because that's, that's been the issue for so many people right now as we watch this election issue unfolding and a lot of focus on it. So we have to ask, how can suffering be a gift? How can betrayal and suffering be the wrapping of the gift? That's what I want to kind of sh flesh out a little bit. Now, first century Israel was operating under the law God had given them. But it had been a, it was in a corrupted criminal form. They had taken this perfect law that God gave to administer to the human race, to that nation of Israel, and they had turned it into a form of greed and corruption. And this is what happens with all governments. They eventually turn into that. Because behind all that is the devil who corrupts corruptible people. People make up government. People have sin natures. People have old man baggage. People have worldly purposes and beliefs about what's going to make them happy. And so they're easily bought off with prosperity. The idea of prosperity and for their children and children and all that, prosperity to, have, to build. And see, this is what government, the fallacy of government, is the opportunity to feed at the trough is so great People take advantage of it, 
And when they do, those that are offering blackmail them, control them. That's normal stuff. This has been going on all along the way. It's not new. Same old thing. So, this is what happened in Israel. The leaders had twisted the laws and turned them against the common folk to line their own pockets and keep power. Evil eventually corrupts all human government and then turns the, turns the government against the people of God. So that's what this is all about. This is not about America. America has been a great program. It's not about America. You know, America's come and go. And the issue is the church, the believer, you. All of this is for you. It's for me. It's for those who are going to come to believe. It's to wake people up to the need for the gospel, to wake people like me up to stop looking at all of that corruption as if there's something I can do about it and, it, and as if it's the issue. It is not the issue for the believer. It doesn't mean we shouldn't participate as citizens. I'm just saying the issue is the gospel and your growth. That's the issue. So we're going to use this. God's going to offer it as a gift for you to use it for your growth. That's the only way that you can look at it and embrace it. And, and, and as Paul and James both say, rejoice in it. You first read that, rejoice. When everything falls apart, you're like, you're insane. That's because you're basing your happiness on your circumstances. If, if everything going your way is the key to your happiness, then yeah. When everything falls apart, then you should be upset. But it's not. It's just the opposite. Rhonda and I were talking on the way about relationships and how people will get unhappy in a situation or in a relationship. The other person thinks, well, there's something I can do to alleviate your suffering. And the answer is no. No, because each person determines happiness within themselves. You, you want a trick? What you imagine in your mind about any given situation is going to determine how you feel about it. What you, how you see it in your mind. You can look at all the things you can keep score on all the wrongs in your life, and you can use that to feel sorry for yourself and see it as some kind of awful thing rather than seeing it as what God has allowed to push you, to make you, to mold you, to become the person who has an opportunity to overcome that with God's grace and be a great witness for him. That's the program. Why does God allow suffering in our life? so that at some point we can grow to the place where we can utilize the grace to overcome all that and live free from that for Christ. That's the miracle. The fact that somebody could ever do that from where we start, spiritually dead, lost, separated from God, in, a, in the devil's world of influence, with sinful people as our examples, and somehow God is able to pull you out of that and save you and give you an understanding of who and what he is and inspire you to let go of all that to live for him. Wow. Wow. That's the gift. It's the gift of undeserved suffering. So suffering is what pushes us. God made human government to protect freedom for the gospel to be preached freely. Now, there's a lot of reasons for government. My focus is on the gospel. Now, you, you can read 1 Timothy 2. This is where he says, I want prayers so that we may lead a tranquil. This is prayers for kings, people in authority. So that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. In other words, Paul's praying for those in the Roman Empire, the leaders and rulers, to function in a way that gives them freedom, uh, for not only freedom from 
persecution, but freedom from crime. One of the great things the Roman Empire did was they, they took over the whole area and they instituted law and they enforced law. And all of these bandits and criminals, they disappeared. So people could go all over the world. Paul went all over the world without being robbed. Now, he was definitely persecuted. But, so, that's government. Government's made of sinful people. And Lucifer is constantly manipulating and influencing governments to eliminate the church. The Bible says he is a deceiver of nations. That means he de he's a deceiver of rulers, of leaders. And he uses their greed to do so. He gets people caught up in greed for power, greed for money, and other things. Eventually, he will turn governments to his own purposes to pretend that he can be like God. See, his goal, Ron said it, he wants credit. Now, it's a lie, but he wants it anyway. He wants it anyway. Look, who would you want the appearance of success and happiness if it was fake? I mean, would you want the other person in your life to say, oh, I love you, I love you, when it's not real? Just to please you, just to, just to do what they, you want them to do? Most of the time, that's how marriage works. We, we leverage each other to get what we want. And the other person either goes, not a chance, or they give in to you somewhat reluctantly. We call it love. Yeah, it's like, it's like two spiders. So that's, that's human love. It's corruptible. It's selfish. That's how government is. It's selfish. Selfish people operate government. When you have a government like ours that has been <clears throat> hijacked, where these people get up there and stay for life, they become permanent rulers, just like a ruling class of people. We thought America got rid of royalty. The beauty of America was each individual stood before the law as equal. Not anymore. We have a ruling class. And listen, that ruling class is anti-Christian. Anti-Christian, anti-freedom. Now, I don't know where the Lord's going with this. Maybe we're headed for the rapture. Maybe we're headed for another dark age. Maybe we're going to all stand up and go, no, don't know. I won't say I don't care, but I will say it doesn't matter. It's not our issue. I'm not saying you shouldn't participate and maybe even have to do what you got to do. I'm just saying it's not the real issue. Let's not get trapped and caught up in circumstantial issues, as bad as they might be, and think that's what it's all about. It's not. What Ron's saying this morning about take this time when everybody's thinking Christmas and use it as an opportunity to share that with whoever is in your life. You can't convince anybody. You can't change anybody. But you can show them you believe and that you love. I need to hear that. Even governments <clears throat> designed around divine principles like ours eventually are compromised by the influence of evil and they become anti-Christian. We've been moving in an anti-Christian. Listen, we've chased God out of everything. Does it any wonder that God might be letting us go? <sighs> See, and what your pastor's trying to say to you this morning is that it's up to, uh, we're it's it's us. We're the ones not to go out in the street and march. I'm not opposed to that either. But it's about you growing serious in not only coming to Bible class and listening to another Bible study, 
but making the truth the real part of your life to live that out. God will give freedom and opportunity for that, and that may even look like persecution. Listen, persecution is like, you know, you've seen those race cars with the nitric oxide or whatever, you know, they get that extra boost. That's persecution for your spiritual growth. Take away everything, and what do you have? You and God. You and God. You ought to read the, uh, uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs about the people that got burned, testifying as they're burning up. I mean, even their body was being taken from them. That's, that's the gift of undeserved suffering. So, corrupted Jewish and Roman governments tried to kill Jesus. See, see I'm, you got to look at betrayal. Betrayal's been all through history. Governments betray. Robert Kennedy Jr. is a guy I listen to sometimes. Uh, he's kind of a wacko, but he was, uh, his father was Robert Kennedy that got killed. You know. He said, my father told me, people in positions of power lie to you. They do it constantly. They lie to you. This was what happened. The time of Christ's birth is Herod, when he heard about it, of course, he's already crazy. I mean, he killed two of his sons, and they said his brother only, he, he wasn't able to kill his brother because he died before he could kill him. That's how crazy he was. He heard that there was a new king. Well, he's going to make sure that. So he slaughters the innocents. That's a betrayal. His trust was to, the purpose of his position was to protect the people. But now he's going to use them for his own means. Listen, any position of power, the temptation is to use it for your own self-esteem, to feel like you're some kind of success, like you're important, to draw on the adoration of the people, to build yourself up. And all of that is a huge temptation that we must resist and we must avoid. We must avoid it. I mean, there are millions of women all over the world that adore me. And y'all got the joke, right? I mean, <laughs> Rhonda got it. But it's a little sarcasm. But the point is, we can't let our advantages become a trap. I mean, what, what if you lose everything? You okay? Ask John Dyer. He lost everything, right? Everything. Lost it all. So, he's still with us. Kicking good. All right. The Jewish leaders plotted together about how they might take Jesus in secret and kill him. Matthew 26.3. The Jewish legal system came from God, and the Roman system was the best of its day, and both systems were corrupted because of who was in power. Innocent Jesus went through seven Jewish and Roman legal hoops, trials. Innocent guy taken, scourged, and crucified under the law. Law will betray. It's not to be trusted. It's not to be depended on. It's not to be looked to. It's wonderful when it works, but listen, you can't depend on it. It comes and goes. One of the traps that we in America have fallen into as Christians is looking to the, the human aspects of our government and our system. And, you know, I was raised to be proud of America. I am. Very proud. That makes it difficult for me to let it go. Makes it difficult. But listen, in my life, it's been, I've been, it's been a misemphasis. I put more emphasis on it than I have. I mean, when I'm, not, when I'm not able to let it go and understand that God has allowed it to let go, to be gone and to be washed away, to re be replaced by whatever... Listen, that affects my life only circumstantially. Nothing about my spiritual life changes. Nothing. 
Nothing. And what, you know, you say, well, where's the blessing in that? Where's the blessing in losing everything and being coming under? Where's the blessing? The blessing is showing you and coming to realize that none of that really matters. That's the blessing. So you can focus on what's important. You know, the, the soils, the four soils, one of them was the guy that grew up, but he got all distracted by the cares and worries of the world. He pr produced nothing. That looks, that's, see, that to me, that's the church. We have gotten so distracted with materialism and prosperity. We think prosperity is blessing. Can be, but so is adversity. So is betrayal. On the night that Christ was betrayed, he took bread. That's what started this for me. I mean, looking at our situation, and I went, geez, what do you say about this? How do you help people prepare for what might be difficult times? Well, my way is to remind myself of what's important. So, you can read these. These are, these are the seven trials. Now, God allows mature believers the gift of sharing in the sufferings of Christ. Persecution for the name of Christ, you can be deprived, imprisoned, even executed for the sake of Christ. Now, suffering for his sake is not self-induced misery. So, a huge difference. Peter says, even if, 1 Peter 3, 14, even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. Do not fear them, nor fear the trouble that they cause. Now, what's interesting is this is a fourth class condition, which means if you suffer for righteousness, I wish it were so, but it's not. In other words, listen, you have to get to a mature place in your life where you stop shooting your own self in the foot, where the sufferings of your life are not because of wrong thinking from your baggage, that's a lot of our suffering. Growing up, we got all these wrong ideas, and now we've kept them in our life. We still look at life through that, through that lens. So when things happen, all of that comes back, and we go, oh, no. Here it goes again. I'm going to be abandoned. I'm going to be left, or I'm going to be betrayed. Well, yeah, you are. Sure you are. Listen, if you love anybody in this life, you risk loss because this life is trans. Nothing stays here. It's not meant to be. Nothing stays. Nothing's permanent here. Now, when you understand that the flow of all that is part of the God's program to produce this wonderful, wonderful result, Paul says... Get your mind into that and rejoice. Rejoice in what he's doing. So, he says, don't, don't fear them or the trouble. Suffering for the sake of righteousness is sharing the Lord's suffering. You are blessed. Do not fear them that, that, trou that, that trouble you. Oh, I don't know what I'm saying there. Somebody else wrote that. Right, John, did you write that in there? Oh, no, I'm just kidding. Suffering for Christ is beyond normal adversity. Here's the point. Suffering for Christ is beyond your normal adversity. This is where your adversity is, is because of your testimony or your, your identity as a Christian. You're persecuted. You're, you're slandered. You're whatever because of your relationship to Christ. At least how that's how I'm seeing it. It's the pressure applied to the believer from forces of evil attempting to destroy his or her spiritual momentum and testimony. Listen, you get hit hard in circumstance of your life, and you can either embrace that in the Lord, or you can use that as a reason to quit, to feel sorry for yourself, and, and 
and to go and twiddle your thumbs. And listen, I understand a process. I've been through grief. I mean, I've lost everybody in my family except a couple people. There used to be like a hundred of us, and now they're all, every last one is gone. So I understand grief. I've been through it many times. But look, you can use it to see the truth and embrace it, or you can use it to feel sorry for yourself. Just depends on whether you're going to continue believing that your life consists, what did Jesus say? Your life does not consist of stuff or even people. Ultimately, it boils down to you and him. And that's what this whole exercise of your life is about, is getting it down to you and him. Everything's about getting this down to you and him. Because that's the juice. That's what all he's about. It's getting you down to you and him, not, not abandoning, putting them second. Making it okay when it doesn't go your way. Because you got this, and you're growing in it, and you're learning, and you're opening, and you're relaxing, and you're at peace, and you're trusting, and it's growing in you. That's what this is about. That's what adversity is about. Different forms. Now, Acts 8 1 talks about the great persecution in, uh, against the church. The diagmos means to be chased down. John 16 33, in the world you will have tribulation. Troubles brought on by evil. But what's the rest of it? Have, be of good courage, for I have what? Overcome the world. It's overcoming. Different forms and aspects of suffering for Christ. Hebrews 10, 32 through 34. This was written similar to the time James is writing when he says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. He says, remember the former days when after you had been enlightened, i.e. saved, you endured a great conflict of sufferings, partly by being made a public spectacle through the reproaches and tribulations and partly by becoming sharers with those who were so treated. For you showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property, knowing that you have for yourself a better possession reward and an abiding one, a permanent one. Now, there's four words in that that describe suffering. Uh, pathema is the word passion. It means extreme suffering. It's what describes the suffering of Jesus. You're made a spectacle. A theatrizo means to be a, you're made public theater. Nero took Christians and burned them as candles for the games. Public spectacle. Reproaches is verbal abuse, unjustified insults, sneering, mocking, what all they did to Jesus. And tribulation are just troubles in general. Now, what are the blessings of enduring the sufferings of Christ? I mean, what's the blessing in all this? The suffering is the wrapping. The betrayal is the wrapping. The box in which it comes. Now, when the box opens and you open the box, what's inside? Again, it's going to depend on what you do with it. It's up to you. God has allowed it. He's given you the gift for you to use it to grow, to see what's important and not important, to make that separation in your life, to let go of what's not important and to embrace what is, or literally who is. That's the great blessing of it. So let's look. Spiritual growth. Romans 5, James 1, Romans 8, 28. Everything God allows, he works, he's, he's working for good. But it look, he says to those that love him. What does that mean? Agapao means to be committed to him. If you're a Christian that's still so committed to your circumstances and your financial prosperity that, that these circumstantial sufferings 
blow you away, then you're not reached a place where you understand their purpose. Because your goals are still earthly. And I understand that's a long phase of the Christian life. We're born into the earthly. Our roots are in the earthly. I mean, we grow up in that thinking earthly. You try to take an 18-year-old and tell them that none of that matters, and they'll horse laugh you. Sure it matters. You want to live in poverty all your life? Jesus did. After the disciples went on their mission, they did. You know, I believe that, <laughs> you know, they live this one day at a time for real. And I believe that when somebody gave them extra during the day, that at the end of the night, if they had more than they needed, that they found somebody to give that to. Because they knew what they needed was already on the way so that when they woke up in the morning, it would be there. One day at a time. People would call that poverty, living in poverty. We got nothing. They hadn't got a pot. Don't need one. If you understand what's important, it's okay wherever level that God allows you to live. Now, should, you should quit your job? No. No. Giving in the church would go down. No. Uh, again, I'm teasing you. Please let, please let me have fun. Uh, adversity and loss expose our faith in the earthly, producing anger, fear, disappointment, self-pity. When, when the loss of circumstantial blessings causes fear, anger, disappointment, or self-pity, that shows you how attached you are to them. The blessing is seeing how attached you are to them. And, and being able in the spirit to let go of that attachment, to live free of it. Is that, is that too much to ask? I mean, I, I'm going to tell you, I don't know how many churches I could actually preach this in that people would go, boy, you're right about that. You've got to have some maturity to understand this. But we do. Adversity is our opportunity to express Christian virtue in us from the world, from the Word of God and the, and the Holy Spirit. In other words, under adversity, when you apply doctrine and adversity and you have peace and confidence and you're not, you're not rocked and shocked and beat up and disappointed by the things that happen, and when you're able to, and look, you can't fake that. I'm not saying you're supposed to grunt and grit and fake that. That's not real either. It's from believing the right thing. It's from stop, you stop believing the wrong thing. It's not that. It's not that. It's, it's him. And you have to grow to that. And the adversity is to help you see that, to make that choice. We talk about going through processes. Growth is a process. But listen, it's a process leading you to a decision. The decision is the change. We're supposed to be changing every day, folks. We're supposed to be changing, letting go of things and embracing new things, changing every day. We don't get to a place where we're, okay, I got it. Now God can bless me with all this stuff, and that's going to make my life happy. It's not the model. That's a misunderstanding, a blessing. Becoming a public spectacle. Look, I know. Who wants to be made a public spectacle for the Lord? To be called out and pulled out and dragged out and killed or persecuted or, or tortured or whatever for the sake of the, because you're a Christian. Who wants that? I, I'm not going to pray for it at this point. But if it happens, I promise you this, if it happens to you, the truth and doctrine in you is going to well up under the Holy Spirit and you're going to stand up strong and go, do your worst. Can't harm a Christian. All you can harm is my body. Wouldn't you like to be that guy or that girl? 
had that kind of courage and that kind of trust and confidence, that's who I want to be. I want to be like Jesus. So that's what he did. When it, came, when it all came down, he prayed. He said, Father, there, I know you can make this work another way. He said, if there's any other way, it's first-class condition, if and in there is. But nevertheless, not my will, but yours. This is what you want, I'm in. And it's what he wanted. It's what needed to happen. And he bore up under it. He, he, he was so steady and strong. Like a lamb to the slaughter, he opened not his mouth. He never complained. Not one moment. You know why? Because he was in. He was all in. He knew what was happening. He knew what the purpose of it was. He was all in for the purpose. He wasn't holding on to his earthly life. He wasn't thinking after the cross was over, I'm going to get down here and go find me a nice sweet girl. We're going to have a nice home. Build an earthly kingdom. The devil offered him an earthly kingdom. So don't get distracted by your earthly kingdom. Let the adversities that come in your life, you use them to see how fleeting all that is. I mean, even down to your own body. As you get older, I mean, I, I, I'm with some of you in here especially. You know, it's getting harder and harder to get around and do the things you need to do. Your body's going to, decay, it's a part of Adam's sin, and you go, wow, even my body is betraying me now. It won't do what it used to do. It won't do what I need it to do, or what I thought I needed it to do. What do you do with that? You can get angry, feel sorry for yourself, try every remedy under the sun, or you can let go and realize this is all part of the deal. God's going to spit you out the other end of this thing, and you're going to be like, Wow. Wow. So, adversity makes us suspectable. We become a public drama to teach the angels about grace and mercy. Ephesians 3.10 says he uses us to teach the wisdom of God to them. Suffering for Christ is the greatest witness in the angelic conflict. It teaches us to utilize and reveal God's power. When you stand up under adversity with great courage and confidence and God, they can see God's power in you, that's the ultimate purpose for your life. And, the, and it's to give you a better reward. You will receive a better possession. And finally, Christian behavior for the believer enduring the adversities of suffering for Christ, the gift, the Christmas gift. This is my Christmas gift to you. I'm not going to personally wrap it in betrayal. The Lord has already allowed that in your life. But he said, for Jesus, suffering unjustly, he submitted to unjust legal authority without sin or deceit. <laughs> that means when they pressured him, he, he didn't make any excuses. He didn't shade the truth. He didn't find a way to get out from under it. Listen, why did he... Why was he not tempted to do that? Because he, he knew what he was into. He knew what he was into was not a human issue. It was a spiritual angelic conflict issue. And his purpose was to go through it with grace and peace and confidence. While being reviled, he did not be revile in return. He uttered no threats but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. See, I, this is for me. This is all this is for me. Because I've been pretty angry about some things that I see happening. I've, I've, been, I've fallen into that temptation of emphasizing the earthly more than the spiritual and, and wanting, to, wanting to react and be angry. Wanting to react and be angry. People I love who I feel have betrayed the trust, betrayed our own country. That's just, I, I believe that's true. There's no excuse for me to be angry about it. I mean, what do I expect? Apparently, I expected something else because it, it upset me. 
That means I'm holding on to some unrealistic idea about what's supposed to happen in my life. So when it doesn't happen and some, the opposite happens, I get upset about it. What's the answer to that? See, all of that was so I could see it. I feel it. It's in me. I see it. God said, I want it out of you. Now, you confess that to me, but you keep doing it. You're not changing anything. He said, that's not enough. I didn't give you 1 John 1, 9 as an excuse, a lever you could pull just to keep on going. It's not what that is. He said, I want you to change what you believe about this situation so you can see that I'm all over it. It's got my name. It's what our pastor's saying. My name's written all over this. And it's all for the spiritual benefit of those who are willing to come to Christ and for the church who's willing to see it and grow from it. That's what it's for. Nothing more. Finally, James talks about Job who endured trusting the promises while being patient with people. He says, bless those who persecute you and overcome evil with good. I thank you for letting me speak and teach. It's been a great joy. Uh, you are my family. And uh, I'll be speaking again at 5 today on the Internet, on Facebook. You can find me. Or if you want, we're, we do Zoom. If you want to be in part of the class, uh, send me an email, and I'll send you a, an invitation, and we'll do Zoom. And we'll talk about a, a different Christmas story tonight, but... Uh, or maybe this one again, I don't know. You know, every time I teach the same topic, it comes out different. So let's close. Well, Father, I do, I do pray for America and for its people. And I pray for those who have held to a divine standard. And I pray that you would give them insight and understanding about what's important. And, and, and to have the courage to not pretend, to not be persuaded to pretend, to say everything's okay in an earthly way. It's not okay. It's not okay when lies prevail. But, Father, all that's part of a program for us to grow spiritually. So give us wisdom about what our role in all this is. Is our role to... Fight in the earthly battle, perhaps, for some, I don't know. Is our role to fight in the spiritual battle? For sure. How do we fight? By trust. We let go of the earthly and we hang on to you and the spiritual. And through doing that, we live our life and we show Christ. Pray that for all of my friends here, my loved ones, for my family. Thank you for my pastor, my father-in-law, for his support for all these years, leadership, just the teaching, the faithfulness. Jeez, what a gift to us. There's a Christmas gift. So, Father, we love you. I mean, we just, we just love you. We want to love you more. We want to, we want to be your people. So, so help us, Father. We love you in Christ's name. Amen.